Thank you, Dr. Carl. Well, we start with the first uh, topic, which is the bariatric endoscopy from managing complication to primary metabolic procedures. Will be presented by Professor uh, Kroll. I will briefly introduce Professor Kroll. Uh, he's vice chair of innovation and technology in the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute of uh, Cleveland Clinic. And he's uh, section head of forgot surgery and surgical in, uh, endoscopy in the Department of General Surgery and professor of surgery as well. Uh, okay, uh, so let's start with the first topic. Please, Professor Kuo. Thanks very much. I am assuming I'm playing a video. I don't have my slide deck here, but I have uploaded my video, so if I can play it, that probably is the best way to do that. Hello, I'm Dr. Matthew Crow, Vice Chair of Innovation and Technology and Professor of Surgery at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm going to be speaking today on bariatric endoscopy for managing complications to primary metabolic procedures. These are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent to this talk. The worldwide pandemic of obesity is affecting the majority of countries. And this is also true in the United States where two thirds of Americans are overweight. And obesity associated mortality is second only to smoking in terms of overall preventable causes of death. The laparoscopic evolution has prompted significant uptake of procedures including metabolic and bariatric surgery. And this has been mirrored worldwide with varying degrees of uptake of different types of operations. And now we have prospective randomized data, which shows the durability and effectiveness of our operations. But in addition to surgery, endoscopy may play a role in terms of managing complications, as well as providing primary therapies. There are obviously advantages to this technique because it circumvents operative intervention with low morbidity, but the training and tools available may hinder its widespread adoption. However, the types of op operations and procedures being done endoscopically are becoming more complex because the tools that we have are now allowing us to perform procedures which look much more like laparoscopic operations with retraction, tissue division, and triangulation. And we have instruments that now look like surgical tools that we perform other procedures such as POEM or ESD with, such as a triangle tip knife, an insulated tip knife, a hook knife, and caps, allowing for tissue division and retraction. And we also have more robust suturing devices uh, that allow us for tissue acquisition and clipping devices as well. So all of these tools allow us to manage complications after surgery. And if we look at the types of complications that can occur after all types of bariatric surgery, leaks and strictures remain uh, significant causes of morbidity and they're unique to the types of operations that we perform. And leaks overall are the second most common cause of preventable death. And if we wait and diagnose these uh, complications late, there's a higher morbidity and mortality. And the rates at which these occur are variable as well. And we have a spectrum of intervention in terms of management of these complications, including reoperation or antibiotics and percutaneous drainage. But I want to talk about endoscopic treatment. Endoscopic stents are used for leak, stricture, and fistula. But you have to remember that esophageal stents are, have been designed for malignant palliation, not for an astomotic leak. But this may be ideal for patients that are already high risk, and this provides a minimally invasive approach to intervention. And the types of stents that we have are variable too. Uh, and it's important to know what the characteristics of these stents are, uh, metal versus plastic, or varying degrees of being covered. And now increasingly we have new technologies which include asymmetrical stents and over the wire, uh, as well as through the scope stents. And if we look at the data in terms of stent outcomes for acute leaks, the success rate is quite high. 
In addition to resolution of leak, it allows for resumption of oral diet. However, migration is not uncommon with rates ranging from 10 to up to 60%. And we published a series from Cleveland Clinic in Ohio looking at endoscopic stent management for anastomotic complications and for gut surgery, but also for bariatric surgery included in this cohort. And if we look at one of the major indications, which is leak after sleep gastrectomy, we had a success rate of 81%. And in the more chronic conditions, such as sleep stenosis, these success rates dropped uh, precipitously. Overall, about three quarters of patients had some sort of improvement, but one third of them required surgical intervention at some point. So this may not be the definitive answer. And if we look at the International Sleep Gastrectomy Expert Panel Consensus, this group categorized leaks based on time from initial operation uh, with acute, early, late, and chronic. Uh, and ultimately, it seems that stents may be appropriate for that early, uh, acute, and late phase up to potentially three months after an operation. And what does this look like? This is an endoscopic image of a leak after a sleep gastrectomy, just a few millimeter defect just distal to the gastroesophageal junction. Quite small overall, the patient presented with some left shoulder pain and a mild leukocytosis. This patient underwent endoluminal stenting, and this is the type of stent that was placed. But it's really important to look at the fluoroscopy in this particular patient. So this is the fluoroscopic images of the endoscope in place with some uh, contrast being injected. You can see it coming out of the lumen of the sleeve. These two paper clips mark the pylorus and stenosis respectively. Uh, you can see the contrast collecting under the left hemidiaphragm. A stent is in place, um, and this is the fluoroscopic image across the defect as well as through the stenosis. But as the stent is deployed, hopefully you can see that there's a, a significant amount of not only stenosis, but torsion, where the stent is folding on itself distally right here. So there is a significant stenosis here as well as a twist, and this is what we see commonly for uh, sleeve leaks. Um, uh, that requires stent intervention. But stents can be uh, unpleasant, they can cause pain and reflux to patients, and increasingly we have adopted an internal drainage technique using plastic biliary stents. These are double pigtail designs that traverse the defect that instead of bypass like an esophageal stent allow for internal drainage. And this is what it looks like endoscopically. This is a, a more chronic defect with an external drain outside of the lumen of a sleep gastrectomy. A flexible jag wire is placed into the defect, and under a combination of fluoroscopic guidance and endoscopic guidance, plastic biliary stents are placed through this defect, allowing for drainage internally. This is a five centimeter, 10 French uh, plastic biliary stent. This is its deployment fluoroscopically, and we make sure that one of the flanges is in the lumen of the sleeve. And then because the defect is relatively large, in this case, we placed two plastic double pigtail biliary stents. And if we look at the data on the outcomes, this is a series looking at nearly 70 patients with one to three stents placed across uh, the defect at each time, seven to 10 French each, and they were changed at four to six week intervals. Mean time to therapy was 52 days, but this was largely done as an outpatient with three treatments uh, per patient uh, and a failure rate of only 8%. So this seems to be a good option for patients who have more chronic defects. In big tissue defects uh, with severe dehiscence, endoscopic vac vacuum-assisted therapy has become an option, but this is relatively rare. And it's gonna be in situations like this where there's a big defect, uh, this is after esophagectomy, um, and it allows for, for big tissue closers. But um, this requires an inpatient treatment, relatively small series, and overall the, the results are good, but it's a significant resource burden. Um, because patients require changing of uh, this VAC device, usually on the order of two to three times per week, and this can be um, a significant burden on the, the treatment team. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about endoscopic interventions for weight regain first and then primary endoluminal procedures. We know that after bariatric operations, there is some degree of weight regain, and depending on the literature, what you look at, that can be highly variable. And the indications for reintervention are variable as well. So what do we constitute as weight regain? Is it just um, BMI increase? Is it uh, regain of medical comorbidities or failure to ameliorate comorbidities? And, and what does it look like from an anatomic standpoint? Is it something that we can correct? What is correctable potentially are dilated stomas, uh, fistulae, 
and dilated pouches. And these have been targets for different devices and strategies. And our group in Cleveland looked at endoscopic findings after revisional uh, or prior to revisional procedures for patients with weight regain after gastric bypass. And what we found is in this cohort of patients, the majority of these patients had a dilated gastrojejunostomy over time, up to 60% of them. And we have also uh, found that long-term weight loss has been linked to pouch size and that the GJ diameter may correlate to weight regain. Importantly, we also know that there's significant morbidity and even mortality uh, to undergoing uh, surgical reintervention. So really, what are the outcomes for endoscopic revision uh, of gastrojejunal anastomoses? Well, one of the first series looked at the, really the, the technical and early outcomes of revision of gastrojejunostomy after gastric bypass with weight regain. All these patients had uh, uh, weight regain after a primary room on gastric bypass on average about 24 kilograms with uh, dilated gastrojejunostomies, and their, their definition was a 15 millimeter gastrojejunostomy. The technical conduct of this procedure occurred in nearly all the patients um, and with a 77% overall reduction in the size of that gastrojejunostomy. Good complication profile and excess weight loss at 3, 6, and 12 months was 11.5, 11.7, and 10.8 kilograms. And the same group then looked at longer-term outcomes, now with 150 patients after rural gastric bypass, with up to nine years after surgery. Pre-op BMI 51 got to the lowest point of 30 and then regained to 40. Um, and they were successful in reducing the diameter from 24 millimeters to 9 millimeters. And if you look at this data, up to three years, you can see that that initial 6- and 12-month data that we just talked about in another series seems to be at least relatively maintained over the course of three years afterwards. So this could be a good endoluminal uh, reintervention for patients with weight regain and dilated gastrojejunostomy. Another interesting application that seems to be successful for endoluminal gastrojejunal revision is for dumping. Uh, this is a series that was published in gastrointestinal endoscopy in 2020, um, looking at patients that were relatively far out from room wide gastric bypass, showing significant improvement in their dumping scores uh, before and after endoluminal revision. And they also commented that this could be uh, repeated uh, if there was an initial treatment failure. And how about primary endoluminal intervention? Uh, for treatment of metabolic disease. And this seems to be um, a very promising area. I'm going to talk about some of the devices and technologies that currently exist. And this is a, a, a different group of patients that um, choose this intervention versus surgical intervention. Uh, from a primary uh, standalone procedure standpoint, this may be candidates uh, that won't tolerate general anesthesia or would not uh, be able to undergo surgery, but most commonly, these are for patients that simply don't want surgery. Um, there are also certain situations where we may bridge a patient to definitive laparoscopic bariatric surgery, or that we may give them a primary endoluminal procedure in preparation for other types of surgery. We commonly see this in areas of orthopedic surgery or transplantation. Intragastric balloons are, are known to, to most of us, uh, and they're typically used for class one and class two obesity. Uh, they are temporary and reversible, and, and increasingly, they may or may not even require endoscopy. We do know that success uh, is higher in, when balloons are instituted as part of a multidisciplinary approach, and the physiologic mechanisms by which they work uh, remain to be clearly elucidated, but probably have something to do with delayed gastric emptying uh, and maybe altering fundic distension. But the types of balloons that are available uh, have different strategies in terms of implant duration up to 12 months. Uh, there has been a double balloon type strategy used, uh, multiple balloon strategies, and also strategies which don't require endoscopy at all, but just fluoroscopic evaluation. And if we look at the data on this, uh, this is um, weight loss associated with uh, intragastric balloons in US pivotal randomized control studies. Expectation can be about 6 to 15% total body weight loss versus 1 to 5% in terms of lifestyle alone with low severe adverse events. Uh, and often we see that weight regain after removal can occur, though this may be less than initial uh, baseline weight. This has prompted interest in other uh, approaches as primary endoluminal procedures. 
uh, and there have been various iterations of suturing and plication. One of the most common and widely performed is endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. This is an endoluminal tubularization of the stomach uh, with a curved needle uh, and suturing device. And this is a series of, of uh, images from procedures performed at Clinton Clinic Abu Dhabi, where I was before. First with an initial row, uh, tubularizing the stomach, uh, probably just distal to the incisura, and then up to the fundus with a series of suturing and grasping uh, of uh, a permanent suture, and then often a, a reinforcement layer on top of that to tubularize the stomach as well. And what does the data show us on this? Well, this is a, a multi-center study, three centers with nearly 250 patients at 24 month follow-up. Uh, at six and 24 months, they looked at greater than 10% total body weight loss. And per protocol analysis, 84% of the patients achieved this. And on an intention to treat analysis, 53% did. And the authors concluded that this may work better with adjunctive therapies. And other centers have shown uh, similar successes at up to 18 months. And this is a, a large study from Saudi Arabia looking at uh, 1,000 patients. And they even describe uh, a role for potentially re-intervention with ESG after primary previous ESG as well. Other strategies that have been looked at include barrier liners. These are endoscopically deployed devices that exclude certain parts of the GI tract, uh, either the duodenum or in an experiment, a more experimental model, uh, the stomach uh, and proximal uh, small bowel. The potential advantages of these are that they can be performed as day procedures, they are delivered and removed endoscopically, and could serve as both primary or bridge procedures. Um, however, um, these are not without side effects as well, and we have to also carefully look at efficacy. This is looking at a randomized uh, multicenter trial, the primary endpoint of metabolic syndrome at 12 months, uh, with randomization two to one to control. There's a greater BMI loss in the intervention group at 12 months, but at 12 months after removal, there was no difference. And there was a fairly significant group in the intervention, a uh, fairly significant number in the intervention group that had some sort of device-related complication. And 16% of these patients actually underwent uh, premature explantation. So technology to be aware of, but uh, maybe on hold uh, because of a, a relatively um, higher rate of complications than expected. Promising technology looking uh, at an endoluminal platform is duodenal mucosal resurfacing with primary endpoints not of weight loss, but of metabolic disease treatment. Uh, and this is an ablation of uh, the duodenum just distal to the papilla. And there have been several studies looking at this in terms of outcomes of both uh, diabetes as well as fatty liver disease. This was a multicenter open label study um, looking at uh, short term and then 12 month outcomes from uh, kind of standard metrics showing uh, at least uh, good results in terms of biochemical uh, numbers uh, and modest weight loss, which was not their primary endpoint. So I guess where does this leave us? Clearly the evolution of minimally invasive surgery, not just from metabolic surgery, but all, all general surgery has seen a, a dramatic change in terms of adoption of laparoscopy because of improved uh, outcomes for patients. Endoscopic interventions will not supplant laparoscopic intervention, uh, but will complement it, and there will be certain uh, diseases and processes, especially in metabolic and bariatric disease, that can be uh, used for uh, fixing complications or primary endoluminal procedures, and will not replace laparoscopy, uh, but will be supportive of surgery as a long-term, durable, and effective intervention for treatment of obesity. The BSAFE program, which is a Bariatric Endoscopy Skills Acquisition Fundamentals Exam, uh, which is sponsored by ASMBS and SAGES, is a web-based uh, video curriculum and multiple choice online exam, also with a hands-on technical evaluation. This is an opportunity for surgeons to learn uh, bariatric endoscopy, both from a knowledge and content standpoint, but also from a technical evaluation. Uh, and this is endorsed and supported by both ASMBS and SAGES and will be offered at ASNDS in Dallas and our upcoming uh, SAGES meeting in Montreal as well. You can get more information at this website. So in conclusion, endoscopic access seems ideal, uh, especially for complications because it avoids the operative field uh, and can be less morbid if it is effective. And this has been demonstrated across the spectrum of complications in metabolic and bariatric surgery. 
revisional procedures may reduce morbidity versus surgical interventions. And I think that there's a, a huge opportunity in primary endoluminal procedures, uh, which may fill the gap between medical and surgical intervention. We just have to be careful that the efficacy of the device and the technique is there and evaluate the data as it evolves. New technologies are evolving rapidly and metabolic and bariatric surgeons need to be abreast of what uh, endoluminal intervention looks like, both from a complication standpoint as well as an intervention standpoint. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is my contact information and I'm happy to take any questions you may have now. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture about the role of endoscopy as complication management, revision, and as a primary procedure. Uh, any question from the floor? Uh, if not, as you are very experienced with endoscopy, which is your preference as primary uh, endoscopic procedure for obesity and why? When we talk about primary interventions, it's really important to find the right population. I think most of the time we think of surgical candidates and look at surgical outcomes, but typically these are gonna be at lower BMI patients uh, with less metabolic disease burden. Having said that, it seems like currently the most efficacious primary intervention is ESG. Um, at least the, the outcomes seem to be somewhat more durable than the other interventions, some of the, the devices I talked about are still quite experimental. Uh, but ESG seems to have probably more efficacy than uh, intragastric balloon. It's probably tolerated better than balloon and has a, a longer effect. Okay. ESG is performed by surgeons or by gastroenterologists in your department? In our department, it's performed by surgeons, though one gastroenterologist performs it. The important part is that all of us are part of our uh, metabolic and bariatric program, mm -hmm. and patients are seen within the context of that program, so that we identify patients that may undergo medical therapy, that may undergo endoscopic therapy or surgical therapy. The advantage of being a surgeon and doing endoluminal procedures, too, is that if we see a patient that is a good candidate for um, a ruin y gastric bypass, we can offer that. If they're a good candidate for sleeve gastrectomy, we can offer that. And if they're a good candidate for ESG, we can offer that too. So I'm a very strong proponent of surgeons performing endoscopy, both for management of complications because we understand the operations very well, but also because we can offer surgical intervention and we can offer any patient that comes to our office the right procedure for them. Okay. And finally, do you think the endoscopic procedure are the future of the obesity, obesity treatment or just in, in infancy? Just in the infancy. I think this will fill a gap between medical therapy and surgery. Uh, as you know, only one to 2% of eligible patients for surgery receive surgery worldwide. So there's a huge opportunity from a surgery standpoint. I think endoscopic procedures will continue to grow but they will, they will be applied to patients that are not undergoing surgery currently. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, nice lecture. We'll move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, the next topic is conversion of sleep gastrectomy to renal gastric bypass and will be delivered by uh, Dr. Youngjin, Kim Youngjin. Uh, he was a professor of surgery in Sunchenhyang University for a long time, and now is working as a surgeon in uh, H plus Yangji Hospital. Please, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman, and then hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yongjin Kim. I'm from H plus Yangji Hospital, Seoul, Korea. Uh, today's topic is conversion of sleeve to Ruai bypass. So I have nothing to declare. Uh, this slide shows my case mix. Uh, in Korea, the bariatric and metabolic surgery was uh, covered by insurance, national insurance system from 2019. So after then, the, my case mix a little bit changed. Uh, you can see here the, my, the total procedure of 61% uh, of, of my total procedure is a sleeve. And then Luai bypass is 14% and sleeve due to general bypass is 14% and remaining 20% uh, is revision surgery. Uh, the change is majority uh, due to the BMI 
the IPO insurance coverage is so, so in Korea, the bariatric surgery is available, available from higher than 30. Uh, that is the main reason for changing my case mix. Uh, from 2009 uh, until two, uh, 2020, so I did the revision surgery for uh, 278 cases, uh, mainly the simple band remove, and then second, uh, bend to sleeve or bypass, and third one is a sleeve to uh, bypass or wrist sleeve. <clears throat> uh, today, uh, I would like to talk about the, the technical things and then my short uh, personal experience for sleeve to bypass, but not God patient, only for weight issues. So I would like to uh, analyze my own data. Uh, actually, I cannot conclude any things, but uh, I want to talk about uh, final uh, things about these topics. Uh, the case, uh, 35 years old female, uh, she is South African. Uh, she did uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy uh, 2019, June 26. And at that time, her weight, so 115, the BMI is 43.8, and she also suffering from a polycystic ovarian syndrome. After surgery, so her weight loss outcome is a little bit slower than usual. Uh, so we need sometimes some, uh, the medication, the the Kishimia or Saxenda, uh, so well tolerated. So she reached uh, Nadia weight uh, after surgery is so 15 months. Her weight is 83, and then BMI is 31.66. But after then, she weight regain again. Uh, so her weight is uh, increased to 12 kilogram. Her, BM, uh, her BMI is reached to 36. And also, she's suffering from a severe GERD, so she needs the taking PPI every day. So we decided to convert to Lui bypass. You can see that the uh, esophagitis is severe here, but the uh, uh, CT scan shows no interthoracic migration. The apogeal series, no fundal dilatation, no gastric pouch dilatation. But anyway, <coughs> uh, the main reason for conversion, I think the because of the GERD, uh, but how one to two weight loss more, so I decided to convert to Lui bypass. This is short video clips. You can see that uh, first surgery, no gastric pouch dilatation, and then the sleeve shape uh, a little bit uh, dilated, but it looks great. Uh, if the patient uh, pre-op endoscope and upper, uh, CT scan shows some so hiatal hernia or intrastrophic migration, you have to expose the cross muscle and then dissecting up to mediastinum and then pull down the uh, gastric pouch and then please close the, the cru, uh, cru, uh, cross muscle is needed. So it's a well, if you maybe uh, some experience for sleeve to bypass, so like this clearing the great momentum, so before uh, attached to previous step line, and then it, surgical principle is the same. Uh, you have to mobilize the fundus, not male fundus, but anyway, uh, you have to clean up up to left cross like this, and exposing the cross muscle is also a critical step for the any revision surgery, the bend to sleeve or uh, sleeve to bypass, the exposing the left cross is a critical step for uh, successing the revisional surgery. After full exposure of left cross, and then I will uh, making a new gastric pouch like this. It's the same uh, procedure for primary Roy gas bypass. And then cutting uh, transverse. And then this is very important for every surgical procedure. The reason for the revision for weight loss or the, because of the intractable guard, so you have to make uh, the small uh, gas pouch again, uh, regardless of the gas pouch dilatations. 
uh, like this, uh, after uh, transform transaction and then making a the small gas pouch is the same with primary gas bypass. In this case, uh, fortunately, no severe the fibrosis over the sleeve, but some cases uh, very severe the inflammatory reaction due to maybe the skin stay flow. So you have to clean up the uh, fibrosis is also very important for uh, for the weight loss and then the patient sometimes are uh, feeling the full ease. Uh, actually, in the morning, uh, the video session, so some uh, expert surgeons uh, discuss about the limb length. But I agree with that uh, if the patient uh, wants to further weight loss more, the increasing BP limb is one of the way. But uh, you know, well, it's very should be careful for long-term protein malnutrition or the calcium deficiency. So uh, if you're deciding to uh, revision surgery for, sorry, if you want to deciding the uh, sleeve to bypass, and then if you want to low, uh, want to, uh, lose more weight. Uh, please checking the whole small bowel length and then uh, increasing BP limb is one of the way, but uh, actually I have no idea, but uh, everyone, every expert uh, agree with that, yeah. And then also stomach size. Mouse control is not going to be And then stomach size is a little bit uh, smaller than the first uh, primary Rui gas bypass. Actually, in this video, I made the less than two centimeter, the gastrojezosomy size. Okay. And then other things is very simple and same, so I will skip the video. And then a second topic uh, is my personal experience for weight issues, converting to sleep to Rui bypass from 2012 and 2021, uh, for total uh, 28 patients, I did conversion to Rui bypass. I'm so, oh, we control it, I'm sorry. I'm uh, sorry. So, uh, and the, at the first surgery, uh, the average BMI is 44, and interval from sleep to bypass is 51 months. Uh, if I decide the second surgery, uh, their BMI is, uh, average BMI is 37, and then the total follow from the first sleep, so 80 months. Uh, it's very long, but uh, some patient, uh, the follow-up loss. And then uh, the last visit, their BMI is uh, 32. So I will so, uh, analyze their weight loss outcome. Uh, so, uh, So you can see that the red line, uh, the final outcome, their percent of excess weight loss is uh, higher than 50%, and that means uh, 56%, and total weight loss outcome is also 25%. It's quite acceptable.
제가 마우스 컨트롤 할수 있고요. 네, 네, 네. 알겠습니다. 오케이. 됐어요. 자, I mean uh, finally the percent of excess weight loss and percent of total weight loss uh, depending on the Reynolds criteria is it okay? But uh, at the time of final visit, the percent of excess weight loss less than 50% of patient up to uh, 40%. And then finally, uh, the patient cannot reach the BMI less than 30. It's also very high. And then one also very disappointing findings from sleeve to bypass, additional weight loss, uh, they, they can get at, at the additional weight higher than 60 kilograms, so only 10 patients among 28 patients. So it's very, uh, if you can interpret the metrics, the percent of excess weight loss and total weight loss is okay, but more details, their final BMI and so additional weight loss after Lui bypass uh, is sometimes very disappointing result. So, uh, summarize the, the two, uh, first, uh, two topics. Uh, technical things for if you do the sleeve to Lui gastric bypass, please make the make micro gastric pouch is very important. So anyway, sleeve gastric to me is a restrictive procedure. The Lui gastric bypass is also a restrictive procedure. So if you want uh, additional weight loss more, uh, making the small pouch and small uh, stomach size is very important. And depending on the uh, preoperative the study, but I recommend the high to six exposure is also very uh, important. About the small intestinal limb length, it depends on, on your uh, personal experience and preference. It depends on, uh, I, we have no uh, standard and no consensus about these things. And then the uh, personal experience, experience for weight loss outcome after sleep to Lui bypass, uh, as I uh, explain again, uh, the, uh, like this. Actually, everyone agree with that. The patient suffering from a god and their quality of life is not so good. Uh, converting to Lui bypass is uh, standard. But weight issues, uh, I cannot answer that. Uh, sleep to bypass is reasonable, so I'm not sure that. So I review some article recently. Uh, this is my, maybe the new one uh, for uh, these topics uh, for meta-analysis for more than 500 patients, you can see that only two articles shows the sleep to Lui bypass due to the insufficient weight loss or weight recidivism. The final outcome, the percent of excess weight loss, less than 40%. So leave it, the, maybe it's similar with our result. Uh, and then the BMI loss uh, from 35, 38 to 32, only BMI digit, six digit. Can you imagine that it's a reasonable uh, option for uh, revision surgery for weight loss failure patient? So I, I cannot answer that. And then uh, another long term uh, result also show that you can see that uh, BMI only dropped after bypass five years later, only five or six digits. That's all. Same result. Fortunately, uh, we have enough data before from 2012 and 2017, the similar data was there. That means uh, sleep to bypass for the weight loss failure, failure patient is not a good option for uh, a revision, so revision procedure. So I have a chance to review again about this topic uh, five years ago in our Kinka meetings at, with the same topics. So this is the same slide. So I will be uh, reading uh, this uh, article. So inadequate weight loss after sleep gastrectomy might be a surrogate marker for inadequate weight loss with any bariatric procedure either. Weight regainer after sleep gastrectomy may turn out to be weight regainer after Lui gas bypass. 
So is, this is my final slide. Uh, actually, I told you, uh, as I talked to you, uh, for God problem, it's okay, but weight issues should be very, very careful. If the patient is primary non-responder, I think that uh, after bypass, those patients will be fail, and insufficient weight loss, uh, I'm not sure, for weight uh, loss and then regain recidivism cases, also after gas bypass, weight loss, but eventually uh, weight regain. So that's my idea. So uh, I'm really sorry, so today's my topic. I cannot conclude anything. Uh, I just uh, uh, talk about my experience. Thank you for your attention. Doctor, thank you, Dr. Kim, for the nice lecture and sharing your excellent video. Um, you have converted sleep to gastric bypass, but uh, some patient will have in insufficient weight loss after the uh, revision. So, uh, as I know, the hot topic is the saddest procedure for uh, revision of the sleeve. And what do you think of the procedure? Uh, in the literature, and the SADI means it's a largely malabsorptive procedure. Uh, I think it, uh, it's suitable for SUPO with the BMI is higher than 40, uh, 50, 60, and uh, lots of comorbidities is possible. But you can see that the, our patient BMI is around 38. Uh, I cannot make the short comment generally. <laughs> I, I cannot make it. So, uh, so in Korea, uh, for sleep, uh, weight loss failure after sleep gets to me, the study is not quite a reasonable thing. It's my personal opinion. But if the patient needs more, uh, and then follow-up is possible, and then protein uh, supplementation and any multivitamin supplementation, quite strict, it's okay. But uh, I think in this condition, I cannot do that. Yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fair Hussein, uh, who is my co-chair for the Bariatric Surgery Committee of SAGES. She's also an associate professor of surgery at the Oregon Health Sciences University, and she's the vice chair of surgical strategy and uh, regional operations. And uh, Dr. Hussein is going to be speaking on an important topic, bariatric surgery emergencies and their management. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Farah Hussein, and I'm going to speak about bariatric surgery emergencies and their management. I have a few disclosures. All of these are teaching lectures and technique lectures, primarily for fellowships. Today, I hope to cover the most common complications that occur after bariatric surgery and create a strategy to approach these complications. Our themes throughout the lecture will be to obtain an accurate bariatric history, give everyone a dose of thiamine if there's any concern for malnutrition, generally 100 milligrams of thiamine IV, always use oral contrast for CT scans of the abdomen and pelvis to delineate the anatomy best, and for gastric bypass patients with ongoing abdominal pain, have them follow up with a bariatric surgeon or consider an exploration even with a negative workup. The most common procedures performed worldwide today for bariatric surgery include the sleeve gastrectomy, which is on the far left, and the gastric bypass. The duodenal switch is also starting to happen in higher numbers across the world. And one anastomosis versions of these, like the mini gastric bypass and the single anastomosis duodenal ileostomy or SADI procedure, have both gained traction due to their ease of performance and excellent outcomes. The gastric band or the adjustable gastric band is still around and available, although done in smaller numbers. It's important to know that marginal ulcers are primarily going to be things present in bypass anatomy or um, even potentially in DS anatomy, uh, as well as internal hernias are more in going to be in areas where bowel, small bowel has been moved and repositioned. Our initial evaluation of a patient, assuming that you've not seen them before, is to do it, obviously, history and physical and find out what procedure was done. Patients often can be slightly confused about this and are not clear about what surgery they had. So I often will ask them if they had any complications. How long were they in the hospital? And did they have any additional procedures while they were in the hospital? 
that they go back into the hospital within the first one or two weeks after surgery. Those things give me clues as now the typical stay from bariatric procedures is about one to two nights in the United States. I ask who their surgeon was. And if they had surgery in an accredited center, it requires a team's available and can follow up with their patients. And so you can often obtain an operative report from them. Many patients have on their chart their history labeled as prior gastric bypass, even if they had something like a sleeve gastrectomy or a duodenal switch. So you can't believe the chart 100% of the time. Early sleeve complications will include bleeding, leakage. Most of these will occur within the first week or so of surgery. It can be very obvious, or they can be very subtle. In particular with leaks, they can occur as late as two to three weeks after surgery. So when the patients have gotten further out, you can't dismiss this completely. Patients most, most commonly with leak present with abdominal pain, tachycardia, fevers, they can have nausea and vomiting, and they will often have a reactive left pleural effusion and shortness of breath. You may see this with bleeding as well, particularly if there's hematoma under the left hemidiaphragm. So for bleeding, obviously you will support them, consider blood transfusions, and consider a take back to return to the OR for a washout to identify the bleeding source. These are often managed non-operatively, but may need an exploration as well. Generally, these are going to happen within the time that they're still in the hospital from their original surgery. Although if patients require anticoagulation for other reasons, it can happen when they become therapeutic on their anticoagulation. For a leak, one of the things to consider is the imaging for your leaks. The study cited below by Dr. Bingham et al. looked at um, CT scans versus upper GI fluoroscopy for the diagnosis of staple line leaks. And in looking at a large number of patients followed over an eight year span, what they determined was their CT scan sensitivity was over 95% with oral contrast given. And the upper GI contrasted studies sensitivity only ranged from 22 to 29 to 79%. Specificity was also much higher for the CT scan. So you may need to adjust your contrast volumes. And even if they can only drink a small amount of contrast, you'll get some idea of what's going on with the gastric pouch or the gastric sleeve in this case, and be able to hopefully see if there's an obvious contrast extravasation. You can still miss small leaks, and some of them are very subclinical leaks, and so a negative scan does not 100% mean you're out of the, the woods. You may need to follow up with that. The key there is that a CT scan is much preferred if possible to obtain it. For the sleeve leak, these are often now managed outside of the operating room. Endoscopy and IR have really changed the game for these plans. And you will find that it's often managed with your team to determine the best way to evaluate these patients, particularly if they're stable. If a patient is unstable or they have peritonitis, then you do need to in intervene with surgical management. Quite often, this just means surgical washout, drain placement, and a repair only if the perforation of the lake has happened very early and you have very robust and good tissue. You can also consider an omental patch if you can see the defect easily. While you're in the abdomen, you want to think about enteral access. Does the patient need to have some kind of nutrition long-term? And if yes, consider placing a feeding tube or at least a dop-off tube beyond the pylorus. If there's any distal obstruction, is it something you can uh, address at that time? Is it something narrowed that's allowing the sleeve to leak and stay open? This may be something you address later with the endoscopy team as well, but those are things you should be considering. For the gastric bypass, and this will also hold true for the duodenal switch, leaks are one of the early complications you worry about. You need to really know your anatomy and be able to evaluate your imaging to understand where that leak may be coming from. And know that the leaks and bypass are rare. They're in the less than 1% range for most studies thus far. Bypass patients can also have small bowel obstructions. And so we'll talk about where they can happen and why, as well as ulcers. So leak sites are multiple in the gastric bypass. They can have leaks from the gastrojejunal anastomosis, the gastric pouch, the remnant, and their JJ anastomosis, or the jejunojejunostomy. Obviously, if you're doing imaging on these folks, contrast, again, can be very helpful for evaluating the pouch and the gastrojejunostomy. You need a very small amount of contrast to see this area well, and it's very reliable, generally. The contrast needs to reach down to the jejunojejunostomy in order to see a defect there or a problem there. But again, you don't need a large volume, and it will generally reach within a relatively quick time. However, the contrast will not fill the gastric remnant. 
And so when you have a study with no extravasation of contrast, but you have some secondary signs like free air, free fluid or bowel thickening, don't forget about the remnant. Here are some examples of, of these studies. In the gastrojejunal leak, what you oftentimes will see is a good amount of fluid surrounding the gastric pouch as well as gastrojejunostomy. In the gastric remnant leak on the right, you may not see as much fluid, although you may see a significant amount of fluid as well. You may just see a significant amount of air as well coming from that remnant. So the contrast will usually be the difference between determining where if you think it's gastrojejunal or gastric remnant. Bypass leak management is very similar to sleeve leak management. If they're hemodynamically stable, you have time and you can think about a multidisciplinary approach. If they're not stable, you want to get to the operating room, either laparoscopically or open. It doesn't matter your approach as long as you control the situation. Wash out the belly well, put drains in the area, and consider a repair. If it's early, you can find the leak and you have good tissue. If the tissue is friable, the sutures won't hold, so there's not really a lot of worry to place those at that time, but you can consider doing some kind of a gram patch with the omenta. Also in the gastric bypass patients in particular, we're pretty aggressive about placing a gastrostomy tube in the remnant so that they have access for nutrition for a long term in case this becomes a longer healing process. And then consider the next steps after the operating room, which is primarily endoscopic intervention. Get your GI folks or yourself involved if you do advanced endoscopy and think about approaches to placing pigtail drains, stents, or even endoscopically suturing the defects if possible. There are a lot of different options to approach this leak to make, take to control it even better. And you can do endoscopy on the table while you're doing a washout laparoscopically and essentially do a rendezvous procedure where you place drains very adjacent to the defects, both intragastric as well as intra-abdominal. Marginal ulcers occur for varied, varied reasons, but the two most common are anti-inflammatory medication use, such as ibuprofen or naproxen, as well as smoking and nicotine exposure. However, in studies that have looked at factors correlating with marginal ulcer, even things like sleep apnea, diabetes, and hypertension seem to increase the rate of marginal ulcers. The rate overall can range from anywhere from 4% to 16% in the literature, so it's extremely varied. The ulcers most commonly will present on the jejunal side of a gastrojejunostomy. You can, in fact, see these in DS on the duodenal side or the ileal side of the duodenal ileostomy, although more rare in the DS due to the bile, the presence of bile is often considered to neutralize some of these things, as well as having a pylorus intact. So surgical management of the marginal ulcer. Non-surgical management or medical management is for uh, symptomatic ulcer is optimizing them with a proton pump inhibitor, minimizing acid in the pouch and irritation. Surgical ma management for perforation of bleeding, again, is very similar to a leak. You want to wash out the abdomen, drain the area, and consider an omental patch on the perforation. You can try primary repair if it's very early in good tissue, although you're going to be sewing through an ulcer bed here, so that may be much more challenging. Um, so you don't want to make the defect bigger if you can help it. And then consider enteral access. You want to make sure you can feed these patients because they need good nutrition for healing. So in the ulcer, probably more so than anything else, I really try to ensure that they have good feeding tube access or drop-off tube placement. For a late perforation or a recurrent and non-healing ulcer, this can be a real diagnostic dilemma as usually you've stopped all their anti-inflammatories and nicotine-based products and you've optimized their medications and they still have a problem coming back over and over. Again, we usually start with enteral access to make sure their nutrition is optimized. And we try, in some cases, to over -sew them with an endoscope, to see if we can take care of some of the problems internally. Uh, if that doesn't happen, you have to consider revising the gastrojejunostomy. You may want to consider doing a vagotomy at that time. Some people will even go to remnant gastrectomy and minimize gastrin secretion as well. And finally, if this really becomes a persistent problem for patients, I have reversed bypass anatomy completely for recurrent bleeding ulcers or non-healing ulcers that are just causing a great deal of pain and we can't get to heal. So in these cases of a perforation of a marginal ulcer, much like a leak, you'll see this murky fluid in the abdomen that you have to wash out as much as possible. Often if it's been a, a day or more of this exposure, they'll have this fibrinous exudate on their tissue. The tissue just is a little tougher to work with and a more inflamed. If in the bottom corner you see there, we have found a defect in this case, we are putting some sutures in primarily, but we're also going to likely patch over the top of it and lay a drain very close by. So multiple steps to think about. 
And then finally, before we leave the operating room, we think about what kind of enteral access can we do so that the patients can be fed and given a robust nutrition. This is a case of a chronic ulcer excision that we've performed. So we come proximal on the gastric pouch and we just find a healthy landing zone on the pouch. This is where it helps if your pouches aren't tiny because it gives you some room to still revise the gastrojejunostomy. But we've come above and, and divided the stomach pouch and now we're gonna divide the rulin. And what you see is the amount of tissue we actually remove here containing the ulcer is quite small, maybe uh, two to three centimeters of tissue the hardest part is often peeling it here. You see it's very stuck to the remnant posteriorly. You'll have to peel it off the remnant. You may need to over sew or even wedge out a piece of the remnant to completely remove that ulcer. These ulcers can stick to anything around them. So you may have some difficulty with the dissection, but it's, it is reasonable to resect them completely. Now bowel obstruction after bariatrics for any procedures in bariatrics, you could have a common trocarcite hernia, an adhesion, or even an incarceration of a known hernia. If they had a belly button hernia or some other abdominal wall hernia that has suddenly gotten incarcerated after the surgery. For anastomotic procedures, you have to evaluate for a small bowel anastomosis as the site of the obstruction, as well as for internal hernia. Considerations for the bypass again, you wanna identify your rule limb, your biliopancreatic limb and your remnant anatomy and find what is dilated. This will give you a clue for what level your obstruction is at and where it might be. There's no outlet for your biliopancreatic limb or your gastric remnant. So if you see a great deal of distension in there, remember placing an NG tube will not likely help this situation. So you may be able to avoid that discomfort for the patient if it's primarily biliopancreatic limb and gastric remnant distension. But you may have to act faster in the operating room. Internal hernias, there are several potential spaces for internal hernias that can be missed on imaging. Bowel in the left upper quadrant can often be a sign for this and swirling of the vascular pedicle and mesenteric vessels. Oftentimes with internal hernia, you have a pan dilation of your small intestinal um, luminal diameter. And so watch for that as well. These are two of the most common places shown in the image. One is the pseudo-Peterson's defect above and below is the jejunojejunostomy defect. Oftentimes these are closed, but even as patients lose weight, and especially with massive weight loss, these closures can become more lax because their mesentery thins out as well. So just because the operative report may say that the spaces were closed, if they're having symptoms or signs of an internal hernia, that does not mean you don't take them back. That usually means you should still take them back and check their closures. Here we have an image of a non-dilated remnant. So this shows that likely the obstruction is more on the rulim side. Here we have a picture of a dilated remnant and, and biliopancreatic limb. So this shows that potentially the obstruction is at the JJ um, as the rule limb is also dilated. And here we see that clustering of small bowel in the left upper quadrant that can be a sign of an internal hernia. If you look at studies, there are studies that look at the common signs that are indicative of an internal hernia after gastric bypass. And here, this is a great example of that mesenteric swirl sign. If you see the swirling, even if they don't see an obvious obstruction and even if bowel is decompressed, I will still think about at some point taking them back to look and see. Because to me, this may mean that there's an intermittent internal hernia that's going into a space and coming back out, but it may only be a matter of time before it gets stuck. This is a case with an internal hernia. And what we have done is started at the terminal ilium. We're running this bowel proximally. So we start distal and we run proximal toward the pouch. And here you see, a band of adhesion, and we're fully reducing this rule limb out of that hernia. What you see here is concerning. Our entire rule limb looks extremely ischemic. Our biliopancreatic limb looks healthy, and we're checking for the jejunojejunostomy defect. In this patient, we did not find a defect here. It was a little patulous, so we reinforced that closure, and then we found the actual defect at the Peterson pseudo Peterson space, and that was closed. Thankfully, this patient's bowel did pink up and, and improve over time, but the patient suffered from a protein losing enteropathy for months after this. So even having a significant ischemia to your small bowel that improves with surgery can still lead to consequences. And again, it took months of enteral nutrition uh, as well as time and having 10 to 12 bowel movements a day uh, over those months to finally improve. And thankfully that did improve. So the principles of bowel, small bowel obstruction management and gastric bypass DS at any bariatric patients. Do not just write it off to, as adhesions or self-resolving. 
in these patients, even if it improves, they should probably still be seen by a bariatric surgeon or have consideration for a laparoscopy at some time. An early small bowel obstruction within 30 days is usually still mechanical. So consider intervention. It may be, again, something so simple as a trocar site hernia. This is usually still a technical issue. All others in my book are an internal, her internal hernia until proven otherwise. So if you have an internal hernia, again, run your bowel from distal to proximal and start at the terminal ilium. If you start too proximal, it'll often look like the bowel is twisting or volvulizing more. It can make for a very confusing picture. As you're running the bowel, lie your mesentery flat, and you can look for clues for where the obstruction is happening as the mesentery often is injected, maybe very congested, and you may be getting seeing chylus hypertension in those areas where there looks like chyle is um, congested in that area too. Those are all signs for hernia. So again, even if the hernia has been fully reduced, if I see this on the bowel, it tells me something intermittently is likely getting stuck, and I need to try and find the spaces and reinforce them to their closures. So in conclusion, make sure you obtain an accurate bariatric history, understand the anatomy and pathology in the bariatric patients. Don't forget common problems like trocar site hernias. Check vitamins and replete their vitamins, especially their vitamin B1 or thiamine level, as this can lead to long-term neurologic consequences if left too low for too long. So again, everybody in my ER essentially gets a dose of IV thiamine if they've had a history of bariatric surgery with nausea and vomiting, any time of lack of oral intake or with, if they're not taking supplements. Abdominal emergencies should go to the operating room and do it, the surgery the way you know how. It's okay to do an open surgery if that's how you can take care of these patients. If you can do it laparoscopically, that's great. You can always phone a bariatric friend if you need help. We're always happy to help with trying to navigate the anatomy and figure out what's going on. But it's also safe to do a damage control laparotomy and leave patients in a state where at least the bowel is reduced and you can refer them to another bariatric surgeon at that point. Thank you again for your time and the privilege of speaking today. I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Farah, for an, an excellent talk as always. I have two questions for you. When you do a Roux-Noir gastric bypass, what mesenteric defects do you close, if any? Thanks, Matt, for having me, and thank you to everyone from K-Cells. Uh, I traditionally, when I do a roux noy gastric bypass, I close the jejunojejunostomy mesenteric defect, and I also do close that Peterson space. However, I don't run it closed. I do a figure of eight type closure at the base of the mesentery. So I think there's a lot of difference in how people do these closures. Uh, obviously, I use permanent suture for both spaces, and now I use VLOC quite often for the, the mesenteric defect. I think that's critically important. Uh, and, and, and often in these discussions, we underestimate the technical aspects of it. I think that I also close both of those defects, but it, you have to be very careful how they're closed because small defects that are less, left open are worse than big ones in terms of, of long-term complications. And then obviously you showed some tough uh, cases with anastomotic ulcers after gastric bypass. What is your algorithm in terms of treatment um, duration and uh, medical therapy uh, versus uh, surgical intervention, timelines and, and expectations. Absolutely. Well, we certainly don't rush marginal ulcers to surgery if they are, if their symptoms are relatively well controlled and particularly if they're not at risk for bleeding, uh, which seems to be the biggest nuisance quite often or recurrent perforation. Uh, we will medically optimize them for as long as needed. And once you've developed one marginal ulcer, you'll stay on some kind of an acid blocking medication, usually a proton pump inhibitor indefinitely. We do pair that with care of fate and sometimes add on uh, other cytoprotective, uh, uh, mucosal protective uh, elements as well. We'll do that for six months to a year. And the big thing that drives us to surgery in patients that aren't having an emergency again, like a perforation or bleeding is ongoing pain most commonly. And if they're having pain that is just unrelenting, preventing them from eating, uh, requiring a lot of narcotic pain medications, we start to talk about what can we do. We've just recently really adopted the endoscopic oversewing of these ulcers to see if that helps. And so our algorithm with that is now that's what we'll go to first and see if we can oversew the ulcer and if that relieves any of the discomfort. If that doesn't, 
if they've given an honest about one year time frame of trying to treat these and we're not making much head leeway, then at that point we start talking about surgery. And how do we have enough room to revise the GJ? Uh, at that time, we start talking about what are the other options. If we can't revise it, can we do a reversal of some sort? Do we need to do an esophagogygenostomy, et cetera? And so lots of discussions. I think, unfortunately, all of us who do this have seen not just the initial marginal ulcer, but the recurrent marginal ulcer, and unfortunately, sometimes even the recurrent recurrent. So it's sometimes a gift that keeps on giving. And I do think some people's tissue, for some reason, just very sensitive to this anatomy. And if they're going to get an ulcer every time, you have to start thinking more aggressively. Great. Thanks very much for uh, an excellent presentation and, and the, the questions you've answered. It is Dr. Sang Moon Han. Uh, from Seoul Medical Center in Korea. Uh, and Dr. Han is going to be speaking on technical points of re sleeve gastrectomy. Welcome, Dr. Han. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for inviting me, and uh, Dr. and Matthew, okay, and uh, Dr. Professor Lee. And <clears throat> Uh, let me begin by begin reading the, this slide. Um, uh, today's topic is then the technical points of the list of gastrectomy. I'm working at, at, the, at the Seoul Medical Center in the Seoul Korea. Mm, okay, uh, as you can see here, the sleep. Uh, the sleep is the uh, most common in the procedure and the and the standalone the procedure the worldwide, and you can see the long term and weight loss, weight loss, and uh, the sleep of the weight, the weight loss of the uh, excess weight loss uh, is up to 60 to 70 percent, and you can see here. But as uh, any other in the uh, procedure, the regain weight, the gain rate is uh, increasing with the, as time goes by, with time and. Uh, approximately in the 22 and 30 percent of the uh, regain late towards and reported in after in the primary sleep. And so <clears throat> you can see here in the, the reason of the, the reason of surgery after in the primary sleep, there is in the, uh, you can divide in the three and category to first. During the weight loss failure, uh, it just means then the weight regain, and uh, or and the insufficient weight loss and weight regain that means and the 10 percent of the weight regain after the nadir and the insufficient weight loss it just means uh less than and 50 percent of the excess and the weight loss and the second cause of the revision and the primary sleep is the girl it just the uh it instance is the 20 percent and the third is the no comorbidity resolution, especially in the type 2 diabetes. And so we, at the case, and we will come back to the, and the CD or and the LUA and the gas bypass. And so you can see here, uh, according to the meta analysis, and uh, the, there is in the 32 in the publication, and uh, including the RCT and the observation in the study. 6,600 patients more than the three years follow-up. You can see the, uh, uh, the follow-up duration and between the third uh, two and five years and more than the five years and more than 10 years. You can see the, uh, the, in the more than 10 years and the 22 and the 6 percent of the, and the uh, okay, revision rate. And the uh, total of the above in the revision rate is 10.4%. And more than five, I mean, more than the five years following the patient, the revision rate is late due to the weight loss failure. And the weight loss failure is up to 11.8%. 11 11 the pool rate in the revision and due to the girl is worse than 3%. Uh, with and the, and the respect to the surgical procedure for revision, different lists had and the different and the choices. I prepared and the list leave, I prepared and the uh, lower bypass, I prepared and the study. 
and such as and the Luai bypass and repeat sleep and the pancreatic diversion and the duodenal sweep. Uh, you can see that the technical factor uh, for in the weight regain after in the sleep, the gastric volume is very important. Uh, the gastric volume is the uh, relatively and correlated with post-operative in the weight loss. Uh, 20 and 9, and the ductal progetor is announced and the doubling inside in the gastric size after and two to and three years and the postoperatively. And so uh, you can see that in the different picture, the first and uh, is the, the primary dilatation, and uh, the second is the uh, diffuse, is the secondary and the dilatation. Um, you can see here in the learning curve period uh, or in the superposed patient, you do not uh, easily end up performed in the, this uh, primary sleep. And these cases, you can the remnant to, you see the, the remnant of the gastric fundus is the primary in the dilatation. The, the second is the uh, diffuse in the dilatation is the homogeneous dilatation. Uh, the volume of the remnant stomach is uh, more than the 250 and the CC, uh, CC. And in the cases, uh, you can change the, in the re-sleep and the convert and the bypass on the sleep. Uh, you can see uh, the result of the uh, and the re-sleep. Uh, the, 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 the uh, few and the report was uh, few and the result was reported in the uh, Lisley, and the you can see the midterm result of the and the Lisley. Just only in the sorry to patient Lisley uh, because of the, the weight regain and the time at the and the Lisley and the uh, at the time of the Lisley at the BMI is 41 to and after the sorry six months and the later and the BMI is 29 and so. The percentage of uh, excess and weight loss is uh, approximately 80%. And so, and the, you can see that the Diallo and the result, the five years uh, result of the Lisley uh, in the Dr. Gagne group and the reported uh, this uh, uh, result. And uh, the patient is a 52 patient. And uh, in this group, uh, they uh, use uh, uh, the CT bolometry. CT bolometry is uh, uh, using a CT bolometry, and they check the relative uh, to the gastric volume. And so, in the mean volume uh, pre uh, re sleep is 420 sister. It's the very big uh, the gastric and remnant and volume. And so, uh, 39 patients to have an endless sleep uh, from the, the total of this patient, and the 28 patients um, have and more than 50% of the excess and weight loss. And so, uh, and so you can see that in the uh, meta analysis and uh, 10 article included and uh, 300 and 100 patients included in this study. There is no and uh, there is no end of public in the biases. Uh, approximately, and the excess of the weight loss after the re sleep is the, uh, around the end of 60%, and the operation time is the random, in the random effect model is uh, 78 and in the minute. The overall and the complication rate and the 6.6%, and the uh, leak rate is 2%. And so, they uh, conclude, and uh, uh, in this article, they conclude the, the lipid or and the lipid gastrectomy, and so effective and the feasible in the option uh, after and failed to end the primary in the sleep. And to uh, 20 and 15, we in the reported in the three cases in the lipid gastrectomy uh, experience. And as you can see in the video, the first case is the previously 
she held and uh, bandied and sleep gastrectomy. And so, uh, because you, uh, you can see that in the gastric bending, and then the Swedish and the band, and then possibly you can cut the band. Yeah. And so you can see, and uh, behind the and the band, you can see the and the pseudo capsule, and. Uh, and the the anasologist uh, and uh, they pushed the, and the boozy into the and the stomach, and, and yep. And in this case, you are uh, I'll have uh, the pondectomy and uh, yep. And uh, you can see in the here, uh, it's a fibrous capsule. It's a severe and the fibrous capsule adhesion to the and band to and the uh, stomach, and. During the end uh, the fundectomy or in the gastrectomy, you completely and resected and the gastric and the fundus and the posterior and the remnant and the stomach. And you can see here. Yeah. Uh, in the in the complicated and bound cases, uh, uh, sometimes you can go to the end uh, uh, gastric banding and adhesion to the, uh, the left cruise and in this area and we can uh, complete in the dissect and, uh, and in this area yep. and so and then you can choose then the stapler uh, I prefer then the more thick and thicker in the stapler uh, uh, during the uh, primary sleep I usually I choose the and the gold or and the blue cartridge, but in this case I prefer the green, sometimes a black cartridge. Yeah. And after the section of the fundus, and I uh, usually and uh, have and reinforcement and try to dissect leather. And the next, oh my God. Oh, sorry. Move to the next, next, how can, oh uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, prepare, go back. Yeah, and then the next case is the answer to me. Uh, Firstly, uh, I always send the check through and the dilatation of the gastric pondus. And so you can dissect uh, the, in the audition tissue and uh, uh, always in the cedar and the left cruz level. And yes, always check. And uh, is that very important? And so, and check then the go to the end, the entrum level. And uh, uh, previously, we checked uh, the upper GICs. And, uh, and so, as uh, so we uh, build uh, and uh, the and choose and the anterior and the dilatation and the push to the and the boozy into the end uh, parallel region and I will choose the end, uh, stapler and they go yep and then cut the and uh, interact me yep and this reason do not tightly and place the, and the stapler at the gastric angle. You can see the uh, uh, too tight and the staple, uh, too tight and the distance of the gastric angle, you sometime you can experience the, and the gastric stenosis or in the gastric stricture. And is the, because of the, this, uh, the stenosis, you can, your patient have will be have the gastric girl or leg. And so do not and place the uh, too tight and place the uh, stapler at gastric angle. Yep. Next. Yeah. Sorry. Next. Yeah. Uh, it's a 
is that an old beer? And firstly, you can see the and the clip or and the gastric staple line is then the uh, technical, uh, technical key point and and the grasping the and this lesion and you can uh, dissect uh, the, the, the tissue. Yes, it's uh, the same video. Okay, yep, and full. Uh, dissected on the left crystal and the area and the gastric angle and it comes from uh, angle of his yeah. Yeah. and so in this case is I choose the end black arteries yet yeah. here yeah. okay and this is the And this is the last slide and the take message. And personally, you choose the ideal patient. Ideal patient. If there is no no end of the rotation uh, of the funders, you can do not end the choose. You can end the convert to the, uh, the other procedure. And in this, uh, we pre uh, you use and the seat volumetry and the 3D and reconstruction and the OPGYC. As routine, you check. And during the sleep, you make to the end the uh, trapezoid shape of the end uh, uh, sleep for and prevent the girl. It's the very excellent. And you end completely in the resected and the primary fundus or in the neofundus. And not, not tighten the close the end place and the staple at the gastric angle. Uh, very important, and it's only you use and the thicker and the stapler and the least liberal gastrectomy. Sometimes, if the patient have the, the gastric and the anterior and the dilatation, and you can uh, place the, the two shame from the, the parlors. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han, for an excellent presentation about a, a, a difficult situation. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna, I have just one question for you. How do you select a patient for re-sleeve versus conversion to another operation? And is this a decision that the patient makes or is it something that you as the surgeon makes? Patient. Patient. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes I recommend the other procedure and the bypass on the wrist lip. But in Korea, the most of the wrist lip and the patient have the uh, BMI around and the 32 and the 35. But and so, and I like, like the, the patient and the preference as. It's interesting. I, I have just returned to Cleveland, Ohio from uh, Abu Dhabi, where I practiced before. Yep. And many there did not want gastric bypass. Uh, uh -huh. I imagine maybe that's how it is in Korea, too, where, where a patient has had a sleeve, and, and those patients would prefer to have sleeve again because their BMIs were lower and they never want bypass. So I, I think that in some populations, it is a, is a better decision. I know that. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Han. It's a pleasure to, to hear your talk. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Matthew. Okay. See you soon. Yeah. Uh,